everyone, this is Candace Dickens, Dope Black Therapist, Licensed Clinical Professional Counselor, and I am back from Gambia, Africa. Oh my goodness, this is Black History Month, and this African-American woman could not be more happy than the experience that I had in Gambia. It was life-changing, so much so that I'm trying to recruit people to go back with me. You know, Gambia is the smallest country in the continent of Africa. It used to be part of Senegal, and then it was separated by the British. So they all speak English. They speak English and their native tribe. And these are the most hardest working people I have ever met. They work seven days a week, and they party seven days a week. You got Muslims and Christians living together, and they are amazing, generous, loving people. And one of the things they've said is that, you know, there are other people who come into the country who from, who are colonizers, who come into the country and chop down all the mahogany trees. So now we got to buy mahogany from them. Some other people come into our country and they bought all our rice fields. So now we got to buy rice from them. And what we get paid is not enough to buy rice and to buy beans and to buy wood. So then they struggle just to live. So I'm hoping during this Black History Month, for those who are listening, I have two web pages. One is CandaceRDickens.com. I've talked about that before, where if you're looking for a therapist, you can come find me, call me, have a consultation, da, 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 da. The other one is called The Color of Trauma and Healing. And what it is, is an international website where you can list your agency if you offer services to people who've been impoverished, sex trafficked, um, people who have been violated by the government, who've been imprisoned unjustly. Um, if you're an agency that serves any underprivileged people, please send me an email. I really greatly appreciate it because we want to create a community where people don't have to struggle. So if you're someone who knows how to do farming and I can connect you with someone in Gambia or Ghana, Who's learned, who wants to learn how to farm their land because they don't know how to farm their land, please let me know because here's the assumption. Everybody can farm. It's like the assumption, everybody in America is rich. That's not true. So we want to get rid of the illusions and we look at the reality that people need great teachers. So if you're a farmer, if you're a financial planner, if you're a dreamer, if you're a builder, if you're a clinician, who knows how to treat the trauma associated with loss and grief, the trauma associated with losing a child because of the fact you didn't get good medical care because you couldn't afford it, then I want to invite you to consider coming on my trip during Ramadan next year in 2025. So that's my spiel. Here we go. The topic here is five stages of grief. Now, I'm not just talking about grief, grief. I'm talking about divorce grief. And there are different kinds of divorce. There's a divorce of friendships. There's a divorce of um, romantic relationships, of marital relationships, of partnerships. There's a divorce of work. And for many of us, they all feel the same, right? Like, think about it as a child. We had a couple of dreams. One dream was, when I grow up, I want to be a doctor. When I grow up, I want to be a fireman. I remember being from New York, and I remember seeing a line of people around the corner look, trying to be um, a sanitation worker because they made $50,000. And I don't know about you, but back in the day, that was a lot of money. And today, that's a lot of money. But I remember thinking, when I grow up, I want to be a doctor, lawyer, and on a part-time, a sanitation worker because they made good money. And I got to see how they lived. So one of the things that we dream about is what we want to be. And when people see us as kids, they dream on us. Oh, this person is really artistic. This is going to be an artist. So we dream of being an artist. And we dream of, of doing something that we're passionate about, that we have a calling for. If you're a singer, the dream is to be a national recording artist or to lend your voice to ministry or to do something that's going to change the universe, to change the world. We have a dream. So if your dream was a Cinderella dream, it's to meet the prince, it's to fall in love, it's to become the missus. 
is to have the white picket fence or is to be the man with the beautiful partner on their, on their arms. Regardless of the gender, the dream is to be happy and to multiply for some, and for some is to travel the world with a partner. But there is a dream of something, of having something or someone. There is a dream. There is a dream of friendship. It is a dream of having a peanut butter and jelly friend. A friend that you are like blood brothers or blood sisters, where you pick your fingers and you go, I swear we're going to be friends for life. There is a dream about loyalty and faithfulness. There's a dream about being able to tell someone your secret and it just stays with them. That is the dream that we all want. Someone who is our person, as they say in Grey's Anatomy. Someone who belongs to us. Someone who gets us with no judgment. Someone who's willing to take the time to grow us. Someone who's willing to take the time to listen to us, to laugh with us, to laugh with us as we laugh at ourselves, right? Someone who can say, I'm your partner in crime and do bad things with us. That's our dream. Our dream is about unconditional relationships. So we grow up and we, we fall in love and we go, this is it. This is the thing that I've been waiting for my whole life. Someone who gets me, someone who when, I, when they walk into the room, my heart bursts. I'm filled with adrenaline and excitement and love and passion. And we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna work out together and we're gonna grow together. And then reality comes. And reality comes, it's like the matrix. It's like taking the, the blue pill. It's not what you thought it was. They weren't who you thought you, that you thought they were. And you were not who they thought you were. If you go to a job, I'm excited. I go to get the, I go get the right degree or the right training. I have the great grades and I get there. And I would get selected. Not because I'm not qualified. Because in this world, there is, there are the isms. Whether it's genderism or racism or sexism or transphobia, homophobia, something happens where you don't get the job. And part of that dream that you had was based upon equality and on the belief that if I work hard enough, then I can have the same right as everyone else. And that doesn't always happen. What happens is we can work hard enough and still get denied because of nepotism, because of judgment, because of the, the, the foundation of our country is discrimination. And it's not just here. I saw it in Africa, too. But the dream that you've been working so hard since you were a little, little person was to be somebody, to have something, to make a difference. As Will Smith, I wanted to birth people who had a purpose and a, a journey and a mission. But what happens that when the mission gets interrupted because life shows up, all you have is a disappointment and it can break your heart and it can break your spirit. And if your dream is to become something in your community and the community has not chosen you, but you've chosen it, or your dream is to have a friendship that's like this. And then you forget that just like plants, Friends grow, and sometimes friends don't grow in a straight line. They grow apart. And the dream is that we were going to be frozen in time because we, at six we said it. And then we don't realize that the promise we made was to a six-year-old, but not to a 50-year-old or a 30-year-old whose values might look very different from yours. So what happens? A grief cycle happens. We grieve. But before the grief or in denial, it's like, it's okay, you know, the marriage is okay, you know, it's a little rocky. The job is okay. I finally got the job. It's not the one I wanted. Oh, yeah, it's the one I wanted. But I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's, we see things, but we don't want to see things with the job or we see the friendship. I see it, but I, I turn my head or, yeah, they do that to them, but they don't do that to me. We're in denial about who the person that we're dealing with, who they are and who we are. Or we're in a relationship and we're in denial about who this person is and who they're not. 
So we minimize it. We go, oh, that's how they are. We minimize it. Because to see it would mean it would put us into reality. And that reality hurts. If I'm at a workplace and I'm not afforded the opportunities or I'm, or I'm not getting enough sufficient training or I'm not getting enough opportunities to advance myself, right? I'm like, well, maybe it's because they have budget cuts. So maybe because it's not my turn or they're more senior people. I'm denied, denied. But what's happening is that there might be nepotism or people might be discriminated against me. Or they may not be invested in growing you. They might be just invested in utilizing you. So you become a, a tool to be utilized, but not to be grown and developed. And we're in denial. And that's when the divorce begins. The moment that you can't honor the truth, you're in the process of divorce. The second part is that when you realize that something is wrong and you're realizing that there is a problem there, there's anger. And it's similar to Kubok's grief cycle, right? Where there's denial and then there's anger. Like, oh my goodness, I'm angry because I realize that you're not who I thought you were. Or I realize that you've done something that crossed the line with me. Or I realize that you put me out there and left me alone and you didn't have my back at work. Or I realize that you're my boss and you're writing me up for something that you didn't write the other person up. And I'm angry. And I can't be in denial about the truth. But then what happens is I push that back and I shake it off and get paid. I go back into fantasy. I go back into denial because to stay out of denial means I've got to do something about it. If I see my friend doing something that's horrible and I can't be in denial about it, I've got to do something about it. If my community person is doing something that is so egregious, that they're not helping the community, they're violating the community. I've got to do something about it because not doing something about it makes me angry because I see the truth. And instead of dealing with the anger, what we do is we go into denial or we do the bargaining. We just pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that it's going to get better. Or I, I say to the person, well, let me help you. Or, you know, it doesn't have to be with that. I'm reasoning with the person. I'm bargaining with the person, right? I'm trying to get the person to do something. If you're a parent and you say, what are your kids going a little bit left? You bargain with them. Hey, I'll give you $5 if you can just wash, you know, wash this car. Or, hey, why don't you go for a walk with me and I'll maybe I'll put some money in your pocket. I'm bargaining with them because I'm using that bargain opportunity as a growth opportunity for them to see another way of looking at it. Because I don't want to divorce you. But I'm noticing that there's a loss because with divorce comes loss. It's a form of grief. And it's the grief of the fantasy of how you wished it would be. It's a grief of the fantasy of how you wanted it to be. That's what divorce is. And then once you realize that all the bargaining, all the praying, all the wishing, all the, the helping, all the, well, you know, if I'm, I'm a better person to this friend or if I'm better, a better co-worker, if I'm the best co-worker, I'm going to be able to do great things here. And then when you realize that once that no matter how good I am, no matter how much more I do, it doesn't give me the rewards that I want. I'm just getting more things to do, not more, not more accolades, not more opportunities, not more freedom, not more money, right? Like the money, the math don't be mathing. So once you realize that no matter how much I bargain, like Tariq Ter B. Harrison said, no matter how much I work and no matter how many opportunities I get, and no matter how much I keep saying, well, the next time it's going to be better. Next time, and there's a bargain. The next time, the next time, the next time. Or maybe then we go on this honeymoon and it's going to get better. Or, you know, me and the boys are going to spend some time on the golf course and it's going to get better. Or me and my homeboy, we're going to go hang out. We'll go, we're going to go to the, we're going to go shopping. We'll go to the concert. Things are going to get better. We do that bargaining because we're hoping that that's the thing, the magical thing that's going to happen to fix it. And it doesn't. Once you stop bargaining about a relationship, then you can let it go. Then you can grieve it. You can see it. You can be sad about it. Oh, by the way, I'm not crying. I just got dry eyes. So if you think that I'm crying about this, I'm not. I just got dry eyes. My eyes are serious. But if you want to think I'm crying, if that gives me some extra likes and subscriptions, then go ahead and think I'm crying. But I'm not. But then we can let it go. We can really release it. And let it go. It's hard because once you let something go, there's that shock that starts. It's another grief cycle that begins because it's like, oh, oh, 
you know the word's gonna say, but I'm not gonna say it because it's Black History Month. But it's like, oh wow. But I'm accepting, I'm letting it go. It really is going. The friendship's going. The relationship is going. The job is going. The marriage is going. The partnership is going. And I'm like, oh my God, I gotta accept that this is not gonna get better. I gotta let it go. And once you make the decision to let it go, the shock, like, oh my God, I can't believe I've known this person all my life. Or I had this dream that if I went to law school or became a therapist or became a fireman, that I'd be chief by now. And then the realization that that is not going to happen. And I've got to accept the reality that breaks my heart. That's not going to happen here. It might happen someplace else or with somebody else, but it's not going to happen with this person. What you do, once you release, accept that, and you can release the fantasy and you start bargaining, then you go to another stage of, of grief, the six stages. And it's, it's, it was printed in Psychology Today by um, Robert Tabby. I want to give people credit who deserve credit. And what he says is the first stage is this shock, you know, that you're in shock that it's actually happening. Like, you're all like, wow, this is real. Like, it's like, it's like that, it's the real world. You're in shock that it's happening. Because it doesn't feel right because you've known this person for months or you've been at this this agency maybe for months for years but it's like wow i just got here now i'm leaving well i've been here for 20 years i've raised my kids here now i'm leaving just a shock and a disbelief even if you've been mistreated in a relationship it's that shock like wow it really is over i can't believe it's over and then the third stage is you go into like a blur like wait a minute it's over it feels like a dream Everything goes so fast. People moving out, people shifting, people not talking, people not being intimate, people at work all of a sudden icing you out, not really communicating you, not giving you assignments. And it's like, wait a minute, something's different. I resigned or talked about leaving, but and something has shifted. I'm not giving work assignments. It's like a blur and you feel it. Things start happening around you. And it's hard to catch your breath and catch your footing because all these things are changing. And some of the change is good and some of it's not so good. But it feels like a blur, right? And, and some of that feels exciting and some of that feels like, wow, a new life is starting. But then some of it feels like, wow, a new life is starting. And with that new life, I've got to let go of some other people in that life. Whether it's a friendship who I pinky sweared with, whether it's a, an organization that I pledged with, or it's a business that I started or a partnership that I created or a marriage that I entered. It feels like a blur because you're still in shock. Like, I cannot believe that. It's like winning, winning a million dollars. People think, I can't believe I'm a millionaire. Because it's just like, it's so big a blur. And they'll ask them, what happened last night when you won the money? I don't know. I can't remember. All I remember them saying is I won this money. And I'm because they're so overwhelmed and so shocked that there's a part of them that disconnects from everything and just took and overconnects to the emotional part of the experience. And then the third step, it happens in three months, the fog is clearing and you can really see what things are and how things are gonna end, how this is gonna play out. You get to see the positions people are gonna take and you get to see who, who divides up. If they're coworkers, some coworkers stay loyal to the business and not loyal to you. If it's friendship, some friendships decide to pick choice, pick sides. And it wound you because sometimes, especially if you're the one that's been violated, it's like, why are you not choosing me and why are you staying with them? If it's a divorce, then you least separate. And the people you knew for decades become strangers to you or acquaintances to you. They stop being family and friends. Dry eyes, not tears, dry eyes. Mm -hmm. So, but if you want to think these are tears, like and subscribe. And visit my website at CandiceRDickens.com. That's all I got to say. The next stage is the fourth stage, in which happens about six months, when you try to, to be in legal status or you try to reconcile. Because here's the thing. When there's a cooling off period, even when you leave a job, there's a cooling off period. You're like, oh, they can take me back. And your position hasn't been filled. There's a desire sometimes to go back, to, to flirt with them about being a contractor or, you know, if you break up a friendship, it's, you know, we're cool. We talk a little bit. Maybe we can hang out a little bit. There's a desire to really have connection or pretend that, you know, if you're dating, I left something at the person's house. There's a desire to be reconnected. Even though the connection's broken and unhealthy, 
And there's a part of you that's going back, coming out of the acceptance and going back into the denial of the experience until something happens when you move into the, the next stage, stage four, in which stage five, in which the emotional set dust settles in that this is the end. There is no going back. That things will never be the way they were before. As an employee, as a friend, as a co-worker, as an owner, as a lover, as a partner, things will never be again. And that's when we begin to accept that this is the new life. This is the new normal. The way we accept that this is COVID. It's going to be here for a while. We can't change it. And the last step of the grief cycle that happens in the divorce, professional divorces, personal divorces, romantic divorces, is that we begin a new chapter. Life begins again. You get an opportunity to be new, brand new again, spanking new. But this time you get the opportunity to be, do it wiser. To do it based on reality-based goals, needs. Based on who you are, not who you dream to who you are, but who you are, what you're interested in. No pinky spear. Based upon your personality. What really is a good fit for you? Not what you heard is good, but what you know is good. Divorce is difficult from anything, which is why people will stay unhappily and unhappily married for years. And people will stay at, with employers for decades until they get a pension. Miserable. And they say, well, I'm just staying because of the pension and my social security, or I'm staying because I got good benefits. And you go, wow, but you're staying, but you're not living. And you got, and when we're not happy and we stay someplace not happy, unhappy, unhealthy things happen. Hypertension, irritable bowel syndrome, cancer pops up. When you're at dis ease, dis ease, disease always follows, which is why we'll say nothing is worth your health. You deserve more professionally and personally. If you're in a relationship and you're not happy and you're staying because of the fact that you've got an investment in, you've got a 401 in, you got social security, you got a pension you're trying to protect, this ease enters in or an affair enters in or people exit out by overworking or over traveling or have addictions coming up. But here's the thing. And once again, dry eyes, not crying. So, but if you, uh, if it helps you to think that I'm crying, Please like and subscribe and share this with someone. Dry eyes. I hate it. But I want to say that you deserve more. You deserve more than what you've been given and more than what you've been promised. Grief is a process and grief hurts. Unspoken grief becomes anger and anger becomes rage. But wouldn't it be nice if you can just touch joy? and happiness and embrace them and live with them instead of living with anger and rage and dis-ease. You deserve it. Go through the process. Go until you can get to the rainbow. Create your new reality. I hope this helped someone to hear all the stages of grief, professional, personal, romantic, because grief is about loss, but it's also about new beginnings. Professional new beginnings, business new beginnings, romantic new beginnings, but you can get through it with support. If you're looking for a therapist and you're in D.C. or Maryland, check me out. I'm at CandaceRDickens.com. If you know a good therapist or a good professional, um, good professional person or a good clergy person or a good spiritual person, reach out because during any type of divorce, you need support because divorce is about the separation and the loss. And you, whenever there's a loss, you got to add something to some to you so that you can have support to ground you a little bit, whether it's faith or spirituality or a person or a thing or a dog. But give yourself support because you deserve it. Dry eyes again. Have a great evening, everyone. Like and subscribe. See you at the next YouTube. Bye. No black therapy. Candace Dickens.